Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's webinar. My name is Adam and I'll be your moderator. Dr. Stephanie Tran is our speaker tonight and she'll be discussing 2D and 3D imaging applications in endodontics. If you've ever attended a previous webinar with us, you may have noticed that our in-webinar console has changed. I'd like to highlight some features that will enhance your viewing experience. If you'd like to contact Dr. Tran directly, click the envelope icon under the speaker bio box. If you have a question, please type it into the box labeled, have a question. To talk with other attendees, navigate to your control panel at the bottom of your screen and click the chat icon. And lastly, if you would like to receive CE credit for this webinar, you can click the CE icon in your control panel at the bottom of your screen to complete the form. Please note, you will receive another email formally presenting you with your CE credit. Of course, if there are any CE questions, please feel free to email me at webinars at henryshine.com. All right, let's get this show on the road. Dr. Tran, welcome back. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to my lecture tonight. Um, thank you especially to Adam Sweet for that great introduction. As always, I've been really lucky to have him uh, be my intro host for quite a few webinars now and at the recent Thrive Live session, which was great to work with Henry Schein again for that in person. Uh, today, though, is gonna be a little bit of a webinar on 2D and 3D applications in endodontics. Um, and I'm Dr. Stephanie Tran. I'm an endodontist in New York. Thank you to everyone for joining me tonight and a special thanks to Henry Schein for having me present this webinar series. Um, and we'll get started. So at this is my disclosure slide. Uh, thank you, Henry Shine, for having me be part of this presentation. Um, and however, all the discussions I'm going to be talking about today are all of my own opinion. And we're really just gonna be focusing on CBCTs and uh, 2D radiographs today. So today we're gonna to be discussing what are some of the indicators in both 2D and 3D radiography that we wanna look for when we're trying to evaluate evaluate for complex root canal anatomy, certain factors in the pulp chamber, as well as the canal system and the surrounding bone. I'm not gonna be discussing in particular retreatments or like trauma or any of the, um, any of those so somewhat related topics. Definitely keep an eye out for both future uh, webinars with Henry Shine, as well as some of my possibly previous webinars. Contact them if you're interested in more information about some of my other webinar series on CBCT. So I will be discussing certain topics like that in other webinars. But today, we're gonna to be focusing on root canal anatomy. And why is that? That's because the root canal anatomy can be really complex. And there are definitely certain clues that we can find in both the 2D and 3D radiography to tell us and give us some um, expectation of what to expect. Some of those things are also going to be what findings within the pulp, findings within the tooth and what the tooth shape tells us. And lastly, especially how to evaluate CDCTs um, for that anatomy to help improve our diagnostic accuracy as well. So a little bit about me. I am originally from California. I'm originally a Cali girl, definitely missed that weather, but now I'm in practice in New York City where I practice both in Manhattan and the Hamptons. I originally grew up in California, so I spent my entire education there, went to University of the Pacific for both my undergraduate and my graduate degrees, both my um, undergraduate and dental degrees within their accelerated program. And then I practice as a general dentist, including doing a GPR, because I really love the aspects of comprehensive care dentistry. And that has provided the foundation of both treatment planning and um, diagnostic and prognostic considerations from a larger comprehensive standpoint, as even as an endodontist now. However, my true love definitely is still root canals and endodontic treatment. So I did go back to residency at University of Tennessee. And after graduating, I moved to New York, where I now am in private practice. I treat both adult and pediatric patients in multi-specialty practices. And I have a concierge service where I work very closely with my restorative dentists as well. If you are interested in both this tonight's education and future educations, um, one of my biggest passions is providing dental education 
for the dental community so that we can all elevate our treatment together. And one of the ways I do that is not only through webinars and lectures like this with Henry Shine and other companies, but I also provide it on my social media. You can follow me at Her Holiness the Pulp. Yes, I'm a big fan of puns and jokes. And you can see on my uh, Instagram, I will be posting about my webinar topics, about when I'm going to be lecturing. I also do hands-on courses and also a little bit more about endodontic education and some fun things like even like dental means. So I do discuss endodontic education. So some of the topics that we discussed there, I do discuss also on my uh, Instagram in even more in depth or as well as on a case by case basis. And I do have a little fun with memes as well. So definitely check that out if you want to learn more. Now, first things first, we let's talk about how we use 2D and 3D imaging. And most importantly, how do we take it? Cool. But it's going to be more than just how to take it. Like, I'm sure everyone knows how to click the button on their uh, x-ray machine or how to turn on their CBCT. But there's actually certain tips and tricks when we're taking the x-rays and the CBCTs themselves actually improve, help improve the imaging process itself. So why do we take all these images? We definitely use both digital radiography and often uh, CTs. And it helps us understand both the dental and canal anatomy for endodontics. I do put in the topic of micro CTs in there. I'm not gonna be discussing them in full in this lecture, but I just want people to be aware of the concept of micro CTs because a lot of literature, especially endodontic literature does discuss them. So micro CT is a lot like a CBCT, but the slices are even thinner and the resolution is even higher. So it's like a super, super, super high powered CT machine. However, it can only be used for extracted teeth. So if you see a lot of the literature out there, the literature that I discussed, that's going to be what it's about. Now, specifically, we're going to be discussing digital radiography and, C and cone beams. Of course, when we talk about radiography, we, we talk about radiation. We already have heard in every lecture that we don't use it just as a general screening. We don't take it on every case all the time. We use it when we use CTs only when needed, especially if we can't under, uh, and we especially if we can't um, diagnose fully with just the 2D radiography. And we always follow the alar rule, using as you know just as needed. Now one. One big takeaway that I always like to talk about in any discussion when it comes to CTs or 2D radiography is to try to keep in mind that J-shaped lesions are not pathognomonic for vertical root fractures or split teeth. That means that just because a lesion is shaped a certain way doesn't mean it always means it's a fracture. Um, I'm going to be discussing a little bit about the lesions, how we understand and read them, as well as how... Um, as well as how to diagnose them better, but it's just something we want to keep in mind. And that goes to say that kind of one-minded, one very narrow-minded interpretations of x-rays and CTs are something we want to avoid in everything that we do as dentists. We are dentists, we are diagnosticians. What we're going to do is we're going to put all the clues together to make a diagnosis. It's not just about one shape and all always means something. So we're going to put together the patient's symptoms, what they tell us, the, the findings and the signs that we see in our clinical diagnosis along with the radiographs to make that full diagnosis. So that's just something to keep in mind. Now, when we take any kind of radiography, both 2D and 3D, we want to keep in mind that there's a lot of different factors that can affect the resolution. I'm not gonna go into like exact specifics of what to set things at because that's very, very machine uh, dependent. Definitely talk to your uh, manufacturers and your reps about the best uh, settings for you and for what situations. But the, definitely keeping in mind that the machine itself, what kind of x-ray machine or what kind of x-ray sensors are going to affect it, what the settings are on the sensors and on the machines themselves, and of course, the location on the patient. And that's because anatomy affects how clear the x-rays come out. So when it comes for any radiographs, both 2D and 3D, the more anatomy that's in the way overlapping on the tooth, the more difficult it is going, it's going to be to be able to see all aspects of that tooth. So that goes for 
um, both 2D and 3D. So we know, for example, when we're taking an upper molar, sometimes it's hard to read certain aspects of it, to see all the canals really clearly, to see all the lesions really clearly, that kind of thing. And that's because of the zygomatic arch and the sinuses that, are, that can be in the way. Same thing for certain like molars where the bone is really thick, it can affect how clear it, it is, how clear it's going to be to show up on the x-ray and how easy it is to read it. So for 2D radiographs, it's a little bit hard to control that anatomy location. However, one tip I do have for 3D scans is to try to set the CT to be slightly away from restorations because back and, and away from certain anatomy because that can affect um, and decrease the amount of artifacts and the amount of overlapping that gets in the way. So another, some other things that can affect it are even just how we are able to read it. So actually the computer screen and the computer processors do affect the clarity of the images to a certain extent. That's why I actually see it's kind of funny. So I really like video games. And I've noticed a lot of dentists actually buy certain computers that are meant for video games. And that's because the video game based type of computers and laptops have such good processors really high speed kind of functioning, as well as really good screens and really good graphics cards, because all that can actually make it clearer to be able to read the radiographs. Additionally, within each machine and within each x-ray reading software, there are gonna be like different filters, different like toggles that you can use to affect the graininess, the contrast, the colors, things like that, different filters as well. Again, very machine and pro uh, computer program specific. So definitely talk to your manufacturers about that. But what about the CBCTs themselves? How do we use them then? So, and then how do we improve our reading. So after we've gotten the kind of best machines that we can use and are reading them regularly, we want to be able to understand that they are very useful for a lot of things, such as preoperative diagnosis and treatment planning, evaluating both extraoral and uh, intraoral and uh, intradental anatomy and evaluating all the canals, the root form, the lesions, and the surrounding uh, periodontal tissues as well. Now, when it comes to CBCTs, when we take it, again, another question that is often like, what is the best one that has the best resolution? How do you have the best resolution? One of the things that also affects it is the size of the CBCT as well. The main thing to keep, remember for endodontics is that we want to use the smallest field of view possible. So a lot of times that limited field of view is often like just a sextant or a quadrant, a very small space. And the reason why this affects the resolution is for several things. One is because the beam actually gets collimated. So it's kind of like it's more focused and more focused in that one area. Secondly, it doesn't have all that anatomy in the way. We talked about how the anatomy overlapping actually can affect it, because in this case, even though it's not like a full, full overlap the way it is on a 2D x-ray, the anatomy does absorb the radiation a certain way that does affect how clear the image comes out. And then also the limited field of view or the smaller sizes that we can take do are affected by the um, by they affect are affected by the machine's ability to take certain small slices and voxel sizes. So a lot of times that smaller field of view will purposefully be a, the smallest voxel size possible, and um, a, and so it will have a clear resolution. Higher resolution just means that it's what much more clear less grainy. It's like the comparison of a screen on an iPhone 6 versus an iPhone 12. Clearly, the iPhone 12 has a much clearer screen because it has a higher resolution, so it's easier to see everything in finer details. So with the smaller field of view, that's because we have a higher quality of information rather than having a lot of information. One benefit from having this smaller field of view, it means that there's less to interpret. So you're less as as the dentist, as the providers, we are responsible for interpretation of everything within the scan. If you have a large field of view, you got to look at everything, including all those vital structures. So which is why a lot of times those big surgery type of CTs, full arch, full head type of CTs are often sent out for radiology to interpret. However, a small field of view is the equivalent of like 
two or three PAs. So it's a lot easier to interpret as well. You don't want all this excessive information. You want a very highly focused view of that too. So what about artifacts? Do, do they happen in CTs as well? Absolutely. And unfortunately, the one time we really need to see it, sometimes the artifacts are the artifacts are even more uh, common, such as in when we're evaluating the existence of restorations and roof filling materials. And that's because of a phenomenon called beam hardening. So basically when the radiation hits the existing roof filling materials, it, found, it, it affects and scatters in a certain way that causes these little striations, which we, which we can see like there and there, those little white beams. The white beams cause several issues. First, that it can cover up possible areas of fractures and like the root structure itself. And that, and that is also because they make the existing restorations or materials look fatter or thicker than they actually are. It kind of like blows it out and makes it like very, very white. So additionally, it is a little bit harder to evaluate for different levels of radio opacity just from the flat CT scan itself. The scan often makes like posts look really, really wide. So you have to be really careful about interpreting exactly how thick the post is and how thick the remaining tooth structure is. Lastly, um, some machines have certain like filters you can set so that the posts don't like look so bright white in a certain way, but again, it's very machine dependent. So again, these like little white striations make everything look really fat and wide. Some things to keep in mind. So for example, we can see here this comparison. So for example, we can see in this comparison here, the top right image is the uh, 2D radiograph, and we can compare it to the rest of the 3D radiographs. So the post will show up as this very bright white structure on a 2D, but it's not, uh, it's far more radio opaque than like the gutta percha in that root canal filling material. However, in the CBCT, we can see that the roof filling material and the post show up as the same amount of radio opacity, that bright white color. So metal posts in a 2D radiograph are far more radio opaque than gutta percha, but on a 3D scan, unfortunately, they do show up the same color. So some, it's going to be really important to try to differentiate that when diagnosing. So what about fractures and cracks? Does that mean that 3D radiography is always able to see it better? Unfortunately not. One of the reasons is that beam hardening phenomenon that we were discussing earlier. The other thing is that just because a lot of times very, very tiny hairline fractures are often not revealed on CT as we've seen in multiple instances of uh, literature. Um, and also the existing root canal filling materials can sometimes like block out or that beam hardening can actually um, like cover up where the fracture is. Now, sometimes we can see it very clearly, such as in this example here, where this fracture is very, very obvious, but it's not always the case. And that's something to keep in mind when we're evaluating our CBCTs. Just because you have a CT doesn't mean, oh, it's just because you have a CT scan of a tooth doesn't mean that automatically going to show every single crack and fracture. So how do we use it? A lot of times it's about putting all the information together, areas of bone loss, areas of periapical radiolucencies or mid-root radiolucencies in conjunction with the, the patient's symptoms and signs and where there might be a fracture. So for example, in this image, yes, you can see a fracture very, very clearly here. However, this doesn't always appear on very uh, fine, fine hairline fractures. What we, however, if this fracture did not appear, I still would have been highly suspicious or diagnosed of one. For example, in this case, this patient had biting tenderness, tenderness, and we can see in the CT that on the bottom right image there, there's that very large area of mid root radiolucency, which is often associated with a fracture and not with a lateral canal, for example. So we can see, yes, there is a fracture there, but more importantly, there's that mid-root. 
when we look at a CT, we're also going to be look as we talked about, we're looking at the structures around them. So how do we evaluate the structures? For example, if we're looking at the sinus and that anatomy, what we're looking for, and we can see in this image, in this video here, we're going to be looking at not just the darkness of the sinus, but also that kind of gray underneath it, around the borders of it. So that gray is actually the, the mucus mucosal lining of the sinus. And a lot of times we're going to be looking for that mucosal lining thickening. So certain areas that are very, very thick in that lining, if it's associated with the tooth, so it's going to actually look like it's like blob on um, over the apex of the tooth. That's in the, some, a sign of inflammation or possibly like that the tooth is the cause of a certain area of, of inflammation. Additionally, let's say if a patient did not have any symptoms, but uh, did not have any tooth symptoms. So like vitality testing was all normal, but this patient was uh, had been reporting severe pain in an area. Sometimes we can actually diagnose that's actually a sinus issue by finding that there are very thick, uh, large thickening areas or that cute mucosal lining is thickening as a generalized thickening all around the bottom. And a lot of times that thickening can cause, um, sorry, the New, the sinus inflammation or sinusitis can actually cause um, symptoms that feel a lot like tooth pain. So I always let patients know whenever they talk, like I always ask them about how their sinuses have been feeling. I ask them about if they have had a history of sinus issues because that sinus problems can feel like tooth problems and tooth problems can often feel like sinus problems. So these are some things to keep in mind when we're making that diagnosis. So then what we're going to be looking for on a CT is if the anatomy of the tooth, so if the tooth roots are either A, approximating the sinus, are they right up to the sinus? Are they sometimes even into the sinus? And if the sinus clearly has issues around that area, so such as sinus thickening over that tooth, generalized thickening over all the teeth, or and that kind of thing as well. When we're looking at uh, CBCTs, a lot of times there's a misunderstanding of how to evaluate the CT and how to read it. So there's a big difference, for example, in endodontic interpretation of CBCTs is how we flip through or scan through each of the images. So if you're taking a large field of view, such as for surgery, perio, oral surgery, um, or CEPHs for um, ortho, a lot of times Sometimes you're going to have a slice of the, the slices that go through the entire arch or like the pan kind of views. We don't want that in endodontics. To try to, to help improve our interpretation, we actually want it to be centered specifically on the tooth itself. Um, again, very machine specific, like the functions of it, but you, there is a section of the machine where you can look at just like a small field or like focused on one tooth kind of at a time and you'll see the crosshairs so you can kind of center that. What you want to do is you want to center the crosshairs on the tooth in question, put that uh, long axis in line with the tooth or sometimes even with just per root and then scroll through all the slices in that way. So for example, we can see here when I'm evaluating it, this was a small field of view. I was looking at the tooth with the existing root canal filling material. I had everything centered on that tooth. You may see that the other teeth are become uncentered. That's normal. We want it to be centered specifically on the tooth in question. Additionally, when we look at it, we want to look at all axes and look at all the slice for each axis within that tooth. So for example, we're gonna be looking at all aspects, how the canals change, how the root filling material changes, whether it's centered within the tooth and how the tooth is shaped for each of those slices. Looking at it from a, a progression like that helps us evaluate it as it's changing. Another way that we can see how it's changing is through serial slices. So I go through these types of methods and these types of tips so that way you are best utilizing your CBCT um, so that it's best for you to be able to make that interpretation. So when we're taking um, that CBCT, a lot of times you can set a certain width and then tell the CT to make like slice to show you what each slice looks like. Let's say it's a millimeter and then you have the CT set it like 10 slices. So 
0.1 millimeters each. That way you can see what happens and look at all the slices as a whole together and see how the canal changes and the, or how things change within that section and see how the root and anatomy changes as well. So these serial slices are very handy for you to be able to see if you missed anything as you were scrolling. Now, uh, to touch on this topic very briefly, another way we use CT is often to evaluate existing root canal um, fills, especially if we're trying to diagnose if there's an issue associated with them. So for example, if the root canal fills are centered, if there's a missed canal, that kind of thing. So we do use the CBCT for that. Now we've talked a little bit about how to take the images. Let's talk about now how to interpret each type of image. So for 2D radiography, there are actually a lot of ways that we can look at 2D radiographs and a lot of clues just from the 2D radiographs alone that can tell us so much information about the tooth. Don't knock them down just because, uh, oh, 3D is very helpful to show a lot more information in certain ways. There are so many important details in 2D radiographs that often get missed. I truly feel that understanding and interpreting 2D radiographs is truly an art. So when we're looking at 2D, what are we looking for specifically in endodontics? And I say that because actually all of us have learned in dental school how to do general interpretation of radiographs, yes. However, I've come to realize through talking to my other colleagues in different specialties, each specialty focuses on very specific and very different things. So for example, I as an endodontist look very, very closely at the canal anatomy and the pulp chamber anatomy, for example. However, I don't see quite as many things as my peri periodontal colleagues will see regarding the bone levels or the way the PDL looks in certain ways or the, the, the quality of the bone itself. It's very fascinating. Or how my restorative colleagues will look at like a lot of the radiographs and they will notice like very, very minute details about the restorations or about the um, occlusion or about the shape of the occlusion in a much different way. So it's really interesting to see how each specialty talks about it. On the endodontic end, we do pay very, very close attention to the canals and the pulps pulp and the everything surrounding them. So for example, we'll be looking at the pulp chamber, the um, anything within the chamber, how close the restorations are to the pulp, how big the pulp horns are, if there's any kind of recession in the pulp itself, um, as well as the shape of the canals, the quality, if there, what are some of the differences in the radial opacities and radial lucencies within the canal, because that will tell us different different clues for the anatomy itself, which I'll get to shortly. The frications, periapical radial lucencies and radial opacities and other radial lucencies as well. And um, other details about uh, surrounding the periapical structures as well. One nice thing about webinars that I, uh, I think that are very, is very helpful for everyone here in the audience is that you can take a screenshot of a lot of these details, whereas in person it's very hard if there's a lot of writing to try to remember every single detail. So hopefully if you guys can, if you guys want, you can definitely take screenshots of the slides to help you remember to look for certain things. Now what about that pulp chamber? What are we looking for? So one thing uh, one thing is how receded it is or how tiny the pulp chamber is. So we know that the pulp chamber um, houses all that pulp tissue, which functions not only for sensibility, but also for reparative functions and um, growth functions for the tooth in addition to vitality as well. So that pulp tissue does react to different traumatic incidences. One of those things is with when they're, when they're restorative material close to the pulp, there's caries close to the pulp, or if there's some sort of other traumatic incidences like occlusion or cracks, those things can cause the pulp to recede recede on the radiograph. What it's actually doing is, is that it's building tertiary dentin or reactive dentin um, in response to these types of things. So we can see here on the top left, um, top left image, the pulp chamber horn 
on the uh, on the distal is a lot smaller than on the mesial. And that's because the distal has a much deeper restoration, has a larger DO restoration, so it's closer to the pulp. So it's more receded. Additionally, in general, if there's any kind of traumatic incidences, the pulp chamber as a whole will recede and it will recede over time. So if an older patient may have a smaller pulp chamber, the smaller the pulp chamber is, we have to keep in mind, tip, that the access may be a little bit more difficult because you're not going to have that drop feeling that you have with a much larger pulp chamber. So anything less than two millimeters can be a little bit more difficult to find the canals or to kind of reorient yourself when doing the access. Additionally, that recession of a specific pulp horn will give us clues as to why there, um, that pulp may be reactive or inflamed. So it's some sort of traumatic incidences to the pulp itself. Lastly, as we can see on the top right image, we are going to be looking for certain radio opacities or, radi or how radiolucent the pulp chamber is. So we can see in that top right radiograph that it's kind of like fuzzy looking. It's kind of more radio opaque, kind of grayish, not as an obvious like dark radiolucent kind of look. That kind of grayishness, that kind of radio opacity is consistent with um, some sort of dystrophic calcification or pulp stone. So that tells us to be to keep in mind that there will be pulp stone stones when we are accessing. That's important to keep in mind because anytime there are pulp stones, it makes it a little bit harder to access because it can be very kind of jarring and it can be very easy to get lost. One, the pulp stone can actually be on top of the pulp tissue, so it can cover up where the tissue is and you might be trying to look for the canals. Two, it can actually block the canals a little bit, so it can be very dangerous when placing your, your files in to not keep that in mind and actually cause um, separation of the files or over torquing of the files or, you know, accessing into the wrong area, an area that's actually not the canal itself. Um, and then lastly, we want to keep in mind that the pulp stones can um, have to be removed because a lot of times it can cover tissue and leave bacteria and contaminated tissue underneath it. Another reason, or another thing that we're looking for on a 2D radiograph are unusual radiolucencies. So one of those are radiolucencies that are not in the pulp chamber itself. So for example, resorptive defects. Um, so when there is a radiolucency within the canal system or within the pulp chamber that's excessively like bulging, that would be a sign of internal resorption. However, we can see this kind of like moth-eaten, fuzzy, like it almost looks like termites or moths eating away at the tooth outside of the pulp chamber or away from the pulp chamber, that is a sign of external cervical resorption. Um, a lot of times that external cervical resorption will kind of cause that inflammation within the tooth and get all and eat away at it, kind of like termites. Um, one thing that we want to keep in mind, such as on the left image, is that that resorption often does not go into the pulp itself. Um, it's a complicated process, so I won't get into it too deeply, but basically that pulp tissue causes kind of like a little wall. So you can actually see a very clear delineation. For example, on that left picture, there's the resorption, a border, like so the canal border and pulp chamber border, and then the pulp chamber, because it always kind of stays away from it. It's like a magical force field against resorption. And then lastly, when it comes to the canals themselves, we are going to be looking at calcifications of the canals itself. So how clear is the canal it, um, on the radiograph? How easy is it to see? You know, so are the canals like very clear black lines, very clear radiolucent lines, or does it kind of, is it kind of fuzzy? Does it kind of disappear? So for example, on uh, the first molar of this image, there the canal is a bit, radio opaque. It's not as a clear, obvious, can, visible canal. That tells me that that canal may be very, very, very calcified. Additionally, I'm going to be looking at the path of the canal, where that canal is going, where it ends, where it exits. Does it have a, a severe curvature on that exit? Does it have additional exits? Are there peri-radiolucencies associated with the apex? And if and so I would be expecting that the apical foramen or um, exit, exit foramen is going to be centered at that 
periapical radiolucency. So that radiolucency, it always like grows around. It. It's generally a nice circle around that area. So the, all these are things that we're looking for for the canals themselves, the, the quality of the canal itself. So for example, we can see, yes, this was a very calcified, calcified case with quite a few curvatures. Additionally, when we're looking at the curvatures, we're going to be looking for where that curvature starts and where it ends. So the more severe angle of a curvature that the right at the orifice level tells us that there is going to be a very severe curve that causes the file and you'll have to get into it with the file before it gets into the rest of the canal. That kind of very acute curvature puts a lot of of strain on a file and it's something we have to keep in mind when we're doing not only the access but the instrumentation as well. So sometimes we may have to keep that in mind that we have to be more careful for instrumentation. Additionally, a very severe curvature within the canal um, in the mid root or apical portions can also put a lot of strain on the file as well, which is why these are things we want to look for on a 2D radiograph. So, for example, on the left image, the preoperative radiograph shows that the entrance to the canal, so that the orifice level is very acute. It goes into the pulp chamber very severely before it flares out into the canals. That is a lot of strain on a tooth. The curvature in the mid root section puts a lot of strain on a file as well. And then if there is an additional, any additional curves that puts a lot of strain on a file. Think about it. The more curves there are, just like when you're driving your car, the more strain there is so the number of cur so the type of curvature so how acute it is how severe of an angle it is and the number of curvatures so are is it an s curve does it go like this and then this does it just go like this does the apex have a really severe curvature at the end all those things are put a lot of strain onto uh, the files and so these are all things we want to look for when we're doing our 2d interpretation or our 3D interpretations. And then lastly, we also want to keep in mind certain types of very unusual anatomy. So for example, in this case, not only clinically did this patient have a very unusual presentation, but they have something called fused roots. So we can see on the left hand um, picture on the radiograph that the roots come together. It's not separate roots. So when roots come together, they are easier to extract, that's something to keep in mind. But on an endodontic standpoint, that tells me that the roots are fused. And when the roots are fused, there is off, especially for lower molars, there's often an, an, a phenomenon called a C-shaped canal system. So for example, in this case, we can see that the canals sort of blend together. They sort of, um, be, they have an actually a C shape, which I'll show you on the CBCT scans of this case. But that type of anatomy is difficult for several reasons. So one is that fused roots and C shaped anatomy mean that the canals are not separate little canals. Instead, they're often whole, like almost like a ribbon or sheath worth of tissue and material. That is really difficult to A, clean, B, difficult to instrument very, very carefully because the canals often join and separate and join and separate as this kind of ribbon or sheath kind of thing. And so the canals can easily get caught in several areas. And also that the, um, the files have to clean out every single aspect of it. And then additionally, because it's Views like that, the root structure is often very, very thin in that area. And so you have to be very careful when instrumenting as it is often a higher risk of um, a higher risk of perforation or strip perforations or transportation as well. So we can see these fused roots can present in several ways. So we can see in this uh, the left radiograph, the preoperative radiograph here we can see the, the pulp chamber, we can see the coronal third of the canal system. However, the canals all of a sudden sort of like disappear in the apical half. And we, know, we see that the roots basically kind of come together. So that made me very suspicious of a C-shaped canal system. But then um, we can see in the post-operative radiograph that actually not only 
is it a, a C-shaped canal system? That's because it was a very, very big sheet of, of can canal tissue. So it will actually come together kind of like that. And then what are some other things we're looking for? Even things like uh, premolars can actually be far more complex than we think. So additionally, we're going to be looking at for the anatomy of how the PDL looks because it will give us certain clues. So in the um, premolars here, we have this a phenomenon called a fast break. That's where you see the canal for the coronal third, and then all of a sudden it like disappears. And so what, a lot of times when there's a fast break like that, where you see the canal and the canal all of a sudden disappears, you have to be highly suspicious that's a very unusual anatomy or something's happening. One, there could have been a um, separation of the canals. So it starts as one, uh, one canal system and then separates. Sometimes it can start as two and then join in a certain way and it looks like that will have a certain look to it. Additionally, there may be separate roots that we have to be looking out for and that will tell us that there's certain number of canals. These types of things are all things we have to look out for. So for example, on premolars. On the molar, this is a great example of a double PDL. This phenomenon is where the where if you take a straight on shot of the x-ray, for example, the middle x-ray shows a straight on, um, you might not be able to see a, sec a second PDL that tells us if the root, which is this shape from a cross section, is actually has a second side to it, like it's actually really, really wide, it will show up on a radiograph over here as a second PDL because that, that oval shape or that figure A shape is kind of turned like this and you'll see both sides of it buckle and lingual on the radiograph. So we can see on the left radiograph here, the preoperative, that, that the PDL, the mesial PDLs look like there's two of them. There's one and then two. And so what that tells me is that the um, that there was most likely a second canal in the distal. And that's actually something you want to be keep in mind is 60% of them will have a second canal because um, uh, on a lower molar. So one of the ways we can look out for that is if you can see the two PDLs. And then when we take um, the radiographs, we're going to be looking at not just the roots, not just the PDLs, but at the radio radiolucencies associated with the tooth. So for example, if there is an off angle, um, periapical radiolucency, we can see in this case, it's not centered at the apex. It looks kind of like it's to the side. That can tell you clues that there's actually a lateral canal and that the necrotic uh, tissue and, uh, and the bacteria from that cause the necrosis is causing a lesion in that area. How does it get out of that area? It gets out there with the, through the lateral canal. So that's why it will be localized as we talked about or centralized on a lateral canal and it will look off angle compared to the apex of the tooth because it's where the, the lesion is coming from the lateral canal and not from the apex instead we can see that here in my fill in my post-operative image there's a lateral canal right where the radial lucency is. Additionally, the calcification of the canal itself tells us that sometimes that the canal itself is very, very calcified, which is what I was expecting while I was getting in. A lot of times we're looking for calcifications of the orifice level because we know that the teeth will often calcify or will calcify from the orifice level to the apex, so up from top to bottom. And it will tell us if there's possibility certain curvatures or certain areas of calcification we need to be aware of. What about using CBCT for the interpretation then? So what are we looking for with a CT? It's very similar to a 2D radiograph, but with a few differences. We are gonna be looking at the canal anatomy, but in this case, the 3D image will give us um, idea, an idea of the exact anatomy shape and size because we're seeing it in three dimensions. It'll tell us even more information about the, the pulp chamber. It'll give us a lot of important information about bone loss around the tooth and where exactly is located and the extent of it. We're gonna be looking at radio opacities and lucencies, what the existing root canal filling materials look like, specifically and very importantly, what vital structures look like and um, additional information like that. So when we're looking at the CT, when we look at the canals themselves, we're going to be looking for other uh, very similar factors like we do for 2D. We're going to be looking at where does it start? What kind of angle does it come in from? 
What kind of angle does it exit and where specifically does it exit? Is it very, very close to other structures? Is it close to the buccal plates? Is it um, going to uh, very close to something important like a nerve or do you have to be really, really cognizant about instrumentation? And is it associated with different lesions or different uh, areas? Additionally, we want, we want to look for calcifications as well. Curve, how curved and where the curves are and how thin and thick the roots are. The great thing about 3D radiographs, uh, the 3D radiography with the cone beam is that we can see exactly how thick everything is. That thickness is really important to keep in mind because it will tell that we need to be extra careful about um, situations where the canal is very close to the root structure so that the root is very thin and you'll have a higher risk of strip perforations or perforations if you aren't careful in those very, very thin areas. We can see here, if the root filling material is very, very close to the edge, it means that the root is very thin. What about um, with our surrounding structures? We There are so many things we need to look for and keep in mind when evaluating the CT. So definitely feel free to take a screenshot of this. There's a lot. We want to take a look at the PDL, the bone, all that information, um, as well the proximity to all the vital structures and all the bone and bone loss associated with it. When we're evaluating um, a C the CBCT, we are looking for a lot of information, especially if there is existing root canal filling materials. Feel free to take a screenshot of this slide if you want, but we're looking for a lot of things. How the root canal filling material looks? Is it centered within the tooth? Are there any problems like separated instruments, perforations, that kind of thing, any posts, any issues? And if there's bone loss associated with that root canal filling material, like if it's centered at right where the radiolucency is, is it somewhere else? So that could be a sign of missed anatomy or lateral canal, and if there are any fractures. When we look at the CBCTs themselves, I am gonna go over specific cases. So for example, number one, big, big rule of thumb. If there is, if the, a patient does not have, um, have certain symptoms that match, but there is a lesion, we definitely want to be um, cognizant that there might be a non-odontogenic lesion. If there is, we always wanna take a seat. If it, it can show that that lesion is not associated with the tooth, it's non-odontogenic, and it could be something else, such as away from the tooth, and it could be a cyst or some other sort of non-odontogenic lesion. Another thing we want to use a CBCT for and how we read it is for very, very calcified situations, so very obliterated canals. So, for example, in this case, we could see on that left uh pictures, the preoperative radiographs and the intraoperative radiographs, that the canal is visible, kind of. It's a lot more calcified than the, than the adjacent, adjacent canals. We always want to look at what the tooth in question looks like and what the adjacent teeth look like, because that will tell us why, uh, which tooth is like the different one. Um, so when we're looking for something like that, and it's not, the canal is not very visible, you may want to take a CT if you're not able to find the canal very easily, or if you're very concerned if there is a canal at all. So in this case, I was trying to make sure if there was a second canal, which is why we took that CT, um, the, the material inside the tooth is calcium hydroxide. You can you place that if you are looking for an additional canal, and then you're in the middle of the treatment. That way you can know which one you found and which one you haven't found. Another thing we're looking for is how obliterated that canal is or how calcified that tooth is as well as the bone. So for example, in this CT that I took, we took that CT on a tooth that where I couldn't see the canal at all. So I knew I had to take a CT to know exactly where it is if I can treat it, because if you can't see the canal at all on a CT, there's no way or very, very, very low chance you can see it um at all even clinically additionally the ct was very helpful for taking um, a look at where the bone levels are and where the bone is and where the bone loss is so one of the things we're looking for is where the bone loss has gone to if there is bony perforation of either of the alveolar plates or both and it's a through and through lesion so for example in the top left radiograph we can see the small circle thing is the nasal palatine 
then we have that really large radiolucency around the tooth. We can see the bottom right picture is that the canal is completely calcified all the way until the eighth pole, so that there's no way to do any kind of any kind of um, uh, non-surgical treatment on a tooth like that. And we can see here that the lesion has perforated through both the buccal and the palatal plate. So there, it's a true through and through lesion. And another thing we can see about it is that it's very large, very extensive, and that the, it's even invading the tooth next door. It's invading the apex of the lateral as well. So we want to take a look at these things when we're evaluating um, a CT. We talked about looking at resorptive defects with 2D radiographs, so let's talk about it with 3D. In this case, we can see in, the, in this um, 3D scan that we can see exactly how extensive that resorption is. So we talked about that moth-eaten look. We're seeing that this moth-eaten look has gone all the way down that tooth, even to the point of mid-root or further, when, as well as going very, very internally into the tooth. That tells us that the that this kind of lesion is very complex and that it can be so deep or so extensive that by the time you scoop it all out and remove it, there's not enough tooth structure. So this gives us an idea about prognosis of treatment. This is another case where I had an, a resorptive defect. We can see exactly where it is we can see exactly that it's starting in that cervical area, but not only does it start in the cervical, it ends up very, very, very severe. It goes all the way down the tooth, even into that palatal area right here. We see where it starts in that cervical area there. It's very, very deep and it extends all the way into the palatal. So unfortunately, that tells us that it is not treatable for these type of resorptive defects. Other resorptive defects, though, are much, much more localized. So we can see in this case, we can see that little radiolucency right at that cervical level. It's very, very clear and concise. A CT, though, is still necessary to see extent, how extensive it is. And we can see here that CT shows it's nice and perfectly localized right at that cervical area. We can see it just barely goes into the canal or approximating the canal, and it does not extend all the way up and down. The root, it only stays right at that cervical area. So this tells me that it was very treatable. Now, what about those C-shaped canals that we were talking about earlier? So we can see this is what this kind of case looks like from the 2D on the left, and then from the 3D radiographs, uh, the 3D scans in the middle and on the right. So there's that kind of sheath look that we talked about. The C-shaped canals are very complex because they can start off as canals that join, that then separate, that join, that separate, and then join in many ways. So they can often be very complex. Additionally, the way the curvatures of these C-shaped canals are very, very complex as well. Another thing that we might want to look for is whether or not, or what the anatomy looks like if it is missed and if there are any fractures. So for example, this patient had severe pain, had some deep probing, but it wasn't very clear if there was a fracture. If um, I, I get into this case actually much, much more thoroughly in some of my other previous uh, webinars and some of which are on demand. So definitely check out um, Henry Shine's future webinars that I'm doing with them on 3D and uh, scans and CBCT, as well as some of the previous ones and contact your rep about more information about CBCT. So in this case, this patient either had, I was sus suspecting a fracture or possible missed anatomy that was causing this lesion. And we can see here that there was severe bone loss on multiple sides. And we can also see that there's these radiolucent, um, radiolucent lines that were very, very concern uh, concerning for a possible fracture. But even if they weren't and it was just the beam hardening, we can see that there's severe bone loss in the mid root and apical area. And that mid root area right there and that widened PDL in the mid root area made me very suspect of a fracture. Another uh, situation where we would want to be looking at a CBCT to evaluate the anatomy is if there might be missed anatomy from, for an existing root canal filling material, as well as why there might be bone loss. So for example, in this particular case, um, we can see that there's a very widened PDL or vertical bone loss in the 2D radiograph, possibly all the way to the apex, but not really clear. Unfortunately, this is one of those situations where the 
the anatomy of the zygoma and um, the sinuses get in the way of that apex. So it's not really clear if there's a frank uh, periapal radiolucency or if it's just some vertical bone loss down the side. We're not sure if it's just perio, is it perioendo, endoperio, that kind of thing, or a fracture. So I wanted to see if there was a missed canal, but oh, boom, we can see that there is a widened PDL midroot on the mesiobuccal, on the lingual side, uh, sorry, distal side, a very widened PDL on the mesial side, and a large periapical radiolucency as well. And all this is associated with some mucosal thickening. We can see that the, the, there is some thickening associated as well, and almost some, perf and almost some perforation of the lesion into the sinus all important things to keep in mind and things that we're looking for when we're looking at CP. So we can see here, scanning through it, it's very large and almost perforating the plate of the sinus, the sinus border. We can see that really large um, radiolucency on the mesial, so that widened PDL mid root level that we are concerned about and apical concerns as well. And lastly, what about when we are trying to diagnose exactly which tooth is the cause of the problem? So this was a great patient who unfortunately came in with severe, severe pain in the lower right. Um, it was very hard for her to uh, localize which tooth it was coming from. She was in so much pain that even when I'm doing the, the um, diagnosis, it was very hard for her to distinguish which tooth was the one causing the pain. So for example, all the teeth in that area were having severe of severe percussion and palpation tenderness. And this can happen when everything is very, very, very inflamed. Um, the tooth seemed to not really respond to bold for tooth number 30, but 31 wasn't really clear either. And this patient was in so much pain, it was very hard for her to have a clear response um, to exactly what was happening. In a situation like this, CBCT is so helpful. So what I did was I took a CT of that area and sure enough, what do we find? We found that when you scroll through the slides, uh, the slices, there's a widened apical PDL right there associated with the number 30. And we can see that that widened uh, PDL is right, right in the apical area and comparing it to the premolars or to the other teeth, it's clearly uh, coming from that tooth and not from uh, the other teeth in that area. So that tells us that it's actually coming from that tooth number 30. And sure enough, it also told us, that CT told us that there were only two canals. We can see here only two canals, one, two, rather than three. And sure enough, that's exactly the same way it shows up on the post-operative. So cases like these where the CBCT was so helpful for understanding the anatomy and for making the diagnosis. So because of that, we've gone into a lot of information today about how to take 2D and 3D scans better, how to read them properly, what we're looking for and how, and what are some of the different factors and clues in each type of radiography to know how to make our diagnosis better and how to improve our understanding of everything that's happening within the tooth and around it. Thank you so much everyone for tuning in tonight. You've all been great. Uh, Definitely feel free to contact me if you have any questions. You can either contact me by email or by, on my social media. And if you're interested to, for more dental education, definitely follow me on Instagram at Her Holiness the Pulp and follow Henry Shine's um, uh, different lectures. I, I do a number of webinars with them on CBCT and other information, as well as they have a whole bunch of other great webinars on other CBCT information as well. So um, if you're interested, definitely check it out. Contact them if you're looking for some of the other webinars I've done and keep an eye out because we'll, I'll be doing more with them as well. Thank you so much again to Henry Schein and thank you, Adam. Uh, we can open up the floor for any questions um, if you'd like. Thanks. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Tran. As a reminder, if anyone would like to earn CE credit for tonight's webinar, please click on the CE icon in your control panel to complete the short survey. All right, we do have some questions. All right, first question is, when you talk about the pulp being receded less than two millimeters, what is the reference point you're measuring from? Hi, that's a great question. What I mean is that the size of the pulp chamber itself from the pulp chamber uh, roof to the pulp chamber floor is two millimeters or less. The smaller it is, the more difficult it is going to be to access 
the um, the inside of the tooth that and like be able to feel that kind of drop that we're talking about. It's not being receded from something. It's receded in terms of size. That's the difference. What I'm talking. About. All right. Um, what about in the case where there was a canal filled but an infection, upper molar? What did you do for that treatment? Um. Uh, I'm not sure of exactly which case you're talking about because there were a few with different infections. I think it was regarding the fracture case. That was one of the upper molar examples that we talked about. Um, so if there's an existing root canal, but there's an infection associated with it, then we have to figure out why the infection is there. So I'm not to I'm not exactly sure which case you're specifically talking about, but I'll discuss the different um different case scenarios. So for example, what we always want to look for the etiology of an infection. We always want to make sure that we know why, because we need to see if we can actually treat the source of the infection. So we look at the CT to see where that etiology might be in addition to the signs and symptoms that we find from the discussion with the patient, the clinical findings, and the uh, sensitivity testing as well. So for example, if we if we can see that there's nothing wrong with the root canal except missed canal anatomy, there's no severe probing depths or severe signs of fractures, then yeah, so I think that's okay. The bone loss, it was an upper tooth close to sinus. So I'm pretty sure that that you're talking about the case where it was there were signs of a fracture. But um, to continue with the discussion, because it's a good discussion of concept. So if the etiology is just due to missed canal anatomy, additional um, bacterial contamination, then um, then it's then you know that okay maybe that's the source of infection. You can do the retreatment and and uh, look for healing. However, if all the canals are filled, but there are um, there are signs of infection, we need to see why that might be coming from. Is it just because it was a possibly poorly done root canal? Because it could be because of coronal contamination. So recurrent caries is the big one that often causes reinfections of root canals. That's a very, very common reason. Now, in the case, in one of the cases that I presented where all the canals were filled, everything looked nice, but there was severe bone loss on both sides of the mesial buccal root and the apex. So you can see this very widened PDL on the two sides of the of the root that tells us that there were signs of a fracture because um, there was a deep probing on the mesial buckle itself it was a fairly wide probing depth and there were two sides on the cbct so the mesial and distal portions of the mesial buckle root that tells us that there's signs of a fracture so that's um i for that particular case we recommended extraction um, the next question by the same person is about what a pulp stone looks like on a CBCT. It will look very, very similar to what a pulp stone looks like on a 2D radiograph. However, the difference is that sometimes it may be more clear that the tissue, that there are radiolucency surrounding it. Okay, so some pulp stones are look like it's a separate like blob in the middle of uh of the chamber kind of like what i showed on the duty radiograph some pulp stones will actually look like um a additional like layer on top of the pulp chamber floor so the pulp chamber floor like looks extra thick in an area and all of that's because some pulp stones are attached um so there are many types of pulp stones and different ways that things develop so there are Pulp stones are separate actual like calcification um, like pieces usually, or they are growths upon the walls. However, tertiary or reactive dentin are slightly different. Sometimes it can present slightly similarly, but it's not going to have that glassy look that pulp stones do. And so the recession is where the pulp chamber gets smaller. So you're not going to have that glassy look the way pulp stones do. So slight differentiations. However, histologically, it's often quite similar to dentin. All right. Um, let's do the next one here. When I look at the CT scan of the root canal treated tooth, I often find some areas of radiolucency within the canal where the obturation was done. Does this mean the obturation was insufficient? So not um, not necessarily. It could mean a number of different things. Uh, 
it depends on what you mean of some areas of radiolucency within the canal. Sometimes it can mean there are voids. Sometimes it can mean, which voids in and of themselves do not necessarily mean it's a bad thing, not ideally. Of course, we always want to obturate it as thickly and densely as possible. However, because we are working with a solid, which is the gutta percha, and then a li more liquidy material, the sealer, there is inevitably often going to be some voids. The more, most important part of the root canal treatment, however, is the disinfection process. The voids themselves do not necessarily automatically mean that there's a problem with the root canal, it just, or that it automatically means it's a failure, quote unquote, which we generally do not recommend. And um, the usage of we recommend discussing root canal treatment um, as like diseased or um, symptomatic or functional or that kind of thing. So anyway, back to the thing. Voids do not necessarily mean that there is a problem specifically with the root canal. It just means that there are voids. Now, sometimes if there are too many voids, our concern is that it's not adequately filled and that there can be leakage more easily. However, there are, we're hoping, the ideal is that there are multiple layers to avoid leakage. We're trying to avoid leakage from top to bottom. So that means that coronal seal is of utmost importance. Then that's the next layer is like the orifice barrier, and then the next layer is the gutta percha and the sealer itself. Additionally, that's also why we recommend high flow sealers, like such as the more um, very, very like uh, low viscosity type sealers, such as the modern um, bioceramic sealers or, bio or modern resin sealers. Now, in regards to additional possibilities of radiolucency, it can, often, it can also be something like misanatomy. One of the most common situations that we see where there's miscanal anatomy within one canal is that there, it's either an oval-shaped canal, so the canal is shaped like this. A lot of people make the mistake of only treating it right down the middle, assuming it's only one canal. That's why understanding canal anatomy and shape and knowing ahead, not just knowing it from the CT, but knowing it even just in general, that certain canals are shaped a certain way, certain canals are shaped other ways. So for example, upper anteriors are going to be a very large circle or very large kind of triangular shape in that um, in that coronal part. Lower anteriors may be oval shaped or two canals, depending on the situation, that kind of thing. So when we know that it's oval shaped, we actually want to treat the two sides of the oval like as if it was two separate canals sometimes. So that way you don't get the voids on the sides. Um, so there are different kinds of voids. There's a lot of endodontic literature on it. I'm sorry, that's a bit of a long-winded <laughs> explanation, but there are many different ways to see voids in different situations. Another possibility are fins. So it's almost like the canal has a separate, it's like trying to make a separate canal and it'll just be out like a little fin like that. That often presents as like MB2 or certain, um, certain roots will have like little fins of areas where there's actually can be tissue bacteria. So that's why it's really, really important to either treat those areas with the instrumentation or also with like some sort of uh, activated irrigation to make sure everything is cleaned out as best as possible. It's not just depending on an obturation, it's depending on the irrigation as well. All right, just a quick reminder for anyone still with us, if you do want CE credit, click the CE available icon in the bottom of your control panel, that'll take you to a quick form to receive your CE. All right, looks like we got one more question here. Um, do you have recommendations to decrease the artifact of root canal filling materials in CBCT? That's a great question. So with previous CTs, and this is why I was discussing, like the previous literature did discuss that there are many artifacts present in root, in some of the CBCTs, if there's any kind of root filling materials uh, or restorative materials, it will cause that beam hardening. Now, so, um, a number of the CBCT companies have created different like filters and different like toggle things that you can adjust to help differentiate like grays or differentiate the um, different materials. So you know how we talked about how in a 2D radiograph there will be different differences in radio opacity and radio lucency. So in the, some of the more modern CT machines as well as the modern CT uh, computer programs that you're using to read it, most importantly, um, 
they will have those different like filters and toggles and things that you have to keep on now or that you have to turn on. However, it is important to keep in mind, this is very machine specific and very, um, it's very computer program specific. So definitely talk to your CPCT um, sales uh, person, the manufacturers and, and the computer program that you, or, uh, that you got to read everything to see if they have it and what, how to turn on and off. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Tran, for taking time out of your clearly busy evening tonight <laughs> to do some live Q&A with us. So we certainly appreciate it. Of course, thank you to everyone for attending. Certainly hope everyone enjoyed tonight's webinar. We would certainly appreciate your feedback via our survey that will pop up on your screen shortly. For those of you asking, we did record tonight's webinar, so we'll shoot that out to you via email sometime in the next week. That's all we got. Thanks, Dr. Tran. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in. Definitely um, check out more webinars with Henry Shine, and thank you to Henry Shine for having me. Have a good night, everyone. Thanks. Thanks. Good night.